here um, just after lunch. So I'm going to start, although I expect a few people to trickle in as we go ahead. Um, the topic of today is really trying to scratch the surface in as short time I have allowed in about digital healthcare, blockchain, um, and some key trends to keep in mind whether or not you are currently a practitioner of the healthcare industry. So I, um, you know, I've been working in healthcare for a long time, <laughs> and I lost two already, great. Um, working in healthcare for a long time, and um, we always, kind of, there's always this horrible conundrum that's happening in healthcare, where we have way too much waste, um, and we're trying to figure out to be way to reduce that base. Um, for example, as one of you know, I'm from the United States actually, we pay about $10,000 per person in healthcare, <laughs> versus Germany pays about $5,000 per person in healthcare. Um, the, the metrics are the same to the quality. So there's one great example of base just right there. Um, you know, a, another example that I always think about, I, I talked to a German cardiologist recently, he was talking about an elderly patient he had, a uh, Uma, a grandmother, um, who came in with her family with her whole bag of drugs. She actually came with a bag, a shopping bag of drugs. Um, was she taking all these drugs? Um, did she need all these drugs? We don't know. But the fact that there's that discrepancy is also another example of waste. I have the image of their drugs. It's not always about waste and prescriptions. It's just the idea that um, what is actually needed to deliver the right care, what diagnostic tests are actually needed, um, and how can we just eliminate waste and have the best quality care for patients in general. And then we have inefficiencies. So inefficiencies are, to me, first, anything with paper is inefficient. Um, faxes, which I still see in German healthcare practices, is inefficient. Um, <laughs> anytime you have um, the challenge of just having to have multiple papers and multiple forms to find information. So I'm an American citizen, and when I go to the doctor, I have um, a co-insurance, co-pay I have to pay, around $25. If I had a procedure, then I'm gonna get a bill, and I might get like two more bills, and it'll probably take around 60 days to get all the bills, and then I'll pay one bill, and they'll tell me I have another bill. So there's probably, that means someone is paying, someone is, they're sending mail, um, they have at least two or three different people whose jobs are to send me these bills, and there's a 60 day turnaround in order to get that bill paid or adjudicated, so terminology we use in healthcare. That is grossly inefficient. <laughs> um, anytime um, you get an x-ray radiology, for most countries today, you have to physically sometimes bring that CD with you from one doctor to another. That is inefficient. Um, anytime you go to a new physician, you actually have to have a new diagnostic test run, new blood test, despite the fact you might have just had one two days ago, and, you're, and you're, the results will be almost the same. That's inefficient. So this is one of the major issues you have in healthcare, and of course, I will have some <laughs> solutions, but just why I want to keep that in mind if they're not speaking about healthcare or living in the world, I do every day. And of course, not least is quality. I'm in love with this little baby in this photo. <laughs> so this is the good sign, you know. Um, maternal mo uh, um, mobility rates are all time low internationally. So people are having children um, older, later, safer, um, at early gestation phase. That's great quality. People are living longer. So basically, one thing we have to always remember when we look at new technologies, we try to determine whether or not it's actually needed or will actually move the needle in healthcare. Is is it reducing the waste? Is it reducing inefficiency? And is it at the minimum maintaining healthcare quality, if not even improving it? And um, quality, you know, it's a complex healthcare term. It's not just are you having the best healthcare outcomes? Can you even have access? Are you do you what stops you from seeing a doctor when you can see a doctor? Um, and it's and it's just a whole conundrum or a whole topic around quality, but um, I always ask people, especially people who are not in the healthcare environment, to really take a step back before you approach um, a partner of a healthcare practitioner to use your technology. Are you really improving the quality by someone using your technology? If you're not, then you have a lot harder time to actually get that implemented in the environment that you're in. So um, just to summarize, um, what, what I've been saying is just that, you know, healthcare is just full of uh, a gross amount of waste and inefficiencies. 
and the solutions that are actually getting the most traction in the market, and whether or not that market is in the US, Europe, or Asia, are those that reduce the cost of care, um, which is often around reducing the waste and inefficiencies, and still maintain high quality health care. So this is just, you know, I am always trying to tell people I work in digital health, and most people don't know what it is. <laughs> it's an umbrella term. Just want to put this up, um, definition up there. Um, I think this audience, I assume everyone works every day in blockchain, and that's a main <coughs> goal or passion of yours. Um, and just, I see blockchain as being one sliver, one aspect of solution, technology solutions, within this whole umbrella term, digital health. This um, quote from Eric Toho, who is basically a, huge thought leader, um, the guru of digital healthcare, um, and this is his definition, it's very broad, but at the end of the day, when people say digital health, think of this quote, it might kind of give some guidance of what we're speaking about exactly. So, um, and I, you know, my day job <laughs> is actually to empower, I do kind of two things, I work with corporate investors and VCs um, who are investing in digital healthcare companies, they are continuing to invest in this because of these figures here. So basically, it's in terms of startup industry, it has been steadily increasing with a little dip around 2015, but it's just getting more and more. So this is an international um, assumption of, of total investments in, of, um, in digital healthcare. 794 deals, $9.5 billion. Um, if you ask the people who are doing the reports, what's the difference between deals made in 2017 versus deals in 2015 or basically 2010, we've moved from speculation to becoming a real industry. We see, you know, some of the companies I'll talk about later are outsuits, uh, outskirts of Google, Amazon, um, any other large tech companies. Um, you have all the traditional partners in healthcare payers, insurance companies, rather national and international ones, invest in having teams of people, over 15, 20 people, and digital healthcare. It's become a real serious investment from even the pharmaceutical companies, which I've worked for, where they are not only investing in molecular innovation, but digital innovation. And so I expect this number to completely continue, and that blockchain will have more of an ask, a more contribution to this total figure of digital healthcare investments in the future. So um, digital healthcare, I gave that definition, I wanted to just show, I realize it is kind of hard for me to stand in place else. <laughs> um, some of the kind of key focus areas, and this is not everything, but I chose these groups because I took a look at which digital healthcare technology companies had the most, um, either largest growth, investment growth, and so they all raised over $10 million in a recent round in the last year. Um, so, and they are a lot of American companies, but I also try to make sure I add some European companies that I, I know and respect <laughs> really well. Um, so the first category is consumer experience. These are probably the first thing people think about when you think of digital healthcare. These are the apps that sit in your phone. Um, the majority of them are free for the users, so the model is mainly B to C, maybe B to B to C. One of the highlight is kind of one of my favorites, my sugar Austrian company just got acquired by Roche um, last year, 2017. Um, although they've been working with Roche for like three years. But um, they are actually also great because you know it's a, a set of co-founders and development team that actually have diabetes and they created a diabetes solution for that population. And in the United States, they were the first kind of digital app that was prescribed. Um, so they were approved and doctors started prescribing them and they kind of got what you need to become a successful technology company and that is doctors will talk about and promote you. Um, because at the end of the day, doctors are the gatekeepers and are the manager of healthcare for people. So my sugar is definitely like really high on that list. Clue is um, a newer company, um, very strong financial rounds um, in the women's health space um, with users internationally, both US, US and Europe, they're actually based in Berlin. Um, they are working on their business model, but what they have shown and proven that people, that there is value in this data and this information in helping women track um, their, their women's health, their um, gynecological conditions. Um, Ada is a company, I'm actually affiliated with them, they're my client. Um, they are in Berlin, 
It's a symptom assessment app known as a, a personal health guide. Um, you can, it's available free for people to use with, and they're entering the U.S. market very soon. Um, other personal health companies I could have listed up here are basically any companies that are basically trying to help you assess your health care and how, what makes your health care different and unique. Um, so sometimes that can be interpreted as genomics is around personal health, or it could just be as simple as, like, not that any app is simple or AI is simple, <laughs> um, an application technology that makes sure that it's tied to your specific symptoms, your specific conditions, so that when you're going into trying to get diagnosed for treatment, you're not just getting diagnosed as patient A, but your whole patient, your whole background, your whole history, your whole genetic composition can be involved with your treatment decision. Um, Grail is an interesting company. Um, they are in the cancer detection, and they've actually got really great funding. Um, they are basically using big data to help early detect cancer, which as I'm sure most people in this room have had someone personally affected with or diagnosed with cancer, not lost someone. And it's something I constantly worry about personally, is how will I find out I have cancer too late? And they're trying to solve that problem. Um, I don't want to go through all of these individually, but Oris is a cool robotics company. Um, so they are, so clinical workflow are those companies that are um, really most likely are becoming intersections in the, in the treatment of patients, whether it's in the hospital, as a robotics a surgery company, as OIS or Vital Connect. Vital Connect is basically has sensors that sit on um, people's bodies and helps them when they're in the hospital, outside the hospital, to monitor their progress. Um, the sentence around this is obviously to make sure a patient when they leave a hospital are leaving in the best condition. And secondly, there's also financial incentives in markets like the United States because if you, lose, if you leave the hospital and you come back within 48 hours, the hospital actually loses money. So they want to make sure when they discharge you, you are actually well treated to predict if your outcome is going to be well when you go home and get discharged from the hospital. Um, some health services companies, I just list these because they're actually are providing something that's reimbursable and, and actually directly is something that was a treatment. So Ginger IO is a mental health company, mental health technology app. Um, Tinny Tracks is a German um, um, company that actually uses sound to track tinnitus, which is that humming you have in your ear. They're actually one of the first, if not the first or the second, um, digital healthcare company to be reimbursed um, by a health insurance, TICA, Technica Cross Casa, here in Hamburg, actually. So they're definitely um, a leader in this group. Um, these, these four categories, uh, five categories, um, have something in common. First of all, I just wanna just point out that although I put like consumer experience, big data, analytics, clinical workflow, it doesn't mean that um, the products that they can create are going to be exclusive in one category. So like Ada actually used artificial intelligence and machine learning to deliver their experience and personal health for consumers. So there are three categories already. <laughs> um, Vitaconac also is using big data analytics um, to make sure they can do population health, which is the healthcare term of big data analytics, um, to predict when a patient is going to um, be most likely to need advanced care or not. So that's where healthcare is moving into prediction um, and not just treatment. So blockchain, how does blockchain fit into everything? I'm gonna a glass of water. So when I was speaking before about those recent inefficiencies, I forgot to talk about <laughs> why those really exist. Uh, if you look about anything in business, things exist now for mainly two main reasons, because of um, tradition, outdated systems, but they also exist because there's financial in, um, incentives for the lid to exist. So both in the um, US and Germany, there are intermediaries that are very profitable by being conduits <coughs> of this space and efficiency. Um, and there are considered data clearinghouses, data storage companies, um, middlemen professional middlemen. So let me give an example. I used to work for Express Scripts. Express Scripts is a pharmaceutical insurance company. The model only exists in the United States, probably for good reason, because it's a little crazy. 
So um, they purchase, they, they get the biggest discounts in the world for pharmaceutical drugs. They get better discounts than Germany does. Um, that's because there's only basically three that own all the US prescriptions in the United States, three main pharmacy benefit manufacturing companies. They basically work as two, they're a supplier, so they have the drugs. Um, so they purchase the drugs in wholesale, they deliver them to people in their homes, or they also, um, that's the main way they deliver the drugs, but they also get wholesale price discounts that they return back to the customer. Customer is not always the patient. So how do they work as a clearinghouse or as adjudicating? They, all, they, have to, they have all the transactions for all the drugs they purchase. They have the transactions for all the drugs they sell to every individual pharmacy that exists in the United States. They have the data when they also send that drug to a person. They also have the data for how much that person pays for the drug at retail. And, how, and thirdly, or fourth, they have the data from what um, the insurance gives back to them as a discount. Um, they charge a cut for every little single data point. And that's why the stock is always around 75 euros, a dollars. <laughs> they are very successful in that. All those things are opportunities for blockchain to build efficiencies with. That would, put, that would limit their business. So they would either purchase it or have to compete with it. Um, there are similar clearinghouses here in Germany. Genetech is another um, just technology company that holds data to make sure that data is more secure between hospitals and physician groups. Um, all these technology vendors, a lot of them are great. You know, don't want to offend anyone if they represent these companies. Um, the other challenge is they are creating, they are building a business on that basic inefficiencies. And a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity for blockchain to really just build improvement and kind of eliminate their need in the market. So um, I'm sure everyone knows this. Um, I'm speaking to an audience that is very familiar with blockchain, but the opportunity here is that it's instantaneous, which is amazing when you're talking about something as important as healthcare, to have instant information. You think we should already have it? We don't always have that. We don't always know the blood type of someone when they come into the emergency room. We don't always know their past conditions. Um, it's also traceable. Um, there's a lot of regulations in healthcare. There's a lot of concerns about who has visibility to which data at what time and why do they need it. Um, the opportunity to use blockchain technology to trace viewpoints um, and access is completely boundless and a, and a great opportunity. The security also relates to that matter. And of course, it's just visible. It's creating some transparency that helps, that can benefit companies and eliminate that kind of three point something trillion dollars the United States is paying for healthcare delivery. A lot of um, that amount is paid because we don't know how much money and is being transferred between clearinghouses and databases um, to pass information back and forth. Um, at the end of the day, healthcare information, I'll go into a little bit in more detail later, but it usually stays with the owner. So health insurance company has their own health information, um, and they have their own business models around it. Providers, hospitals have their own. Patients don't have as much, but they should have their own. Pharmaceutical companies do. And they all are in very profitable business because of what they're able to keep within their jurisdiction. And blockchain has the opportunity to revolutionize that and make it more transparent and visible. So here are some use cases I just want to kind of go over. Um, I, this is not an exhaustive list. Trust me. Um, but this, I just thought they were kind of really interesting to kind of look at these different companies and how they're taking different approaches to look at blockchain solutions. Um, Hash Health um, is a US company. Um, they are doing something that doesn't seem important at first, but I understand why it's needed. So they're helping with physician, um, um, physician license disclosure, basically physician license portability. Um, meaning, if you have some insurance companies in the United States that work in multiple states, you know, in a very private insured market, um, but you might have a doctor that's, I'm from New York City area, working in New York, New Jersey. You, that is actually two separate states, different medical licensing, um, and they're helping verify for a doctor and for health systems insurance the, the identity of those physicians. Why is that important? Well, um, telemedicine is here and it's gonna grow more and more. I know there's initiatives to grow telemedicine in um, Germany also, but telemedicine is now becoming covered by more and more insurance companies in the United States. And telemedicine is basically remote care. Having a phone conversation, a doctor chat, where you're at, 
be a phone call with um, your camera on your um, device, PDA or um, computer, and actually be able to have a full consultation for a doctor without having to go to a doctor's office. It's important for young, busy people like most people here in the room. It's also important for elderly people who are tired and have chronic diseases and don't want to always go slept back and forth to um, um, a doctor. And the ability to have a doctor who is a specialist in the field in New York City consult with someone in the Midwest in a more rural area, that they will make that possible. So this the application is important for the United States and any place else where telemedicine is coming is going to grow, grow and that Germany is also one of those places. Um, Jem. Jem is um, working in what I think kind of is the biggest first traction point for blockchain, which is um, autom autonomous transaction validation and the last term in this category is adjudication. Adjudication just means like adjudicating that claim. It's all the the techno the, the transactional um, the transactional functions to know that you have the right revenue when a claim is sent. So insurance markets um, and, and providers are losing so much time to have claims adjudicated. Um, for example, most most hospitals in the United States it takes about sixty days to get money back. More it's like sixty to ninety days to get money back for routine procedures from insurance companies. That's not great business. So Jim is doing that. Jim is actually a Google um, offshoot. Um, they're doing it also doing things to increase the, um, visibility of your electronic health record. Um, they're using Ethereum for their technology as a background, uh, as their actual technology and blockchain. And they seem to be one of the kind of just growing um, fields. They're also doing something interesting with the CDC in the United States. They're doing population health and um, disaster um, um, response. So as you know, natural disasters are increasing more and more in the United States and across the world with hurricanes, tsunamis, you name it. And when disasters happen, you lose medical information. You need to discharge a large amount of emergency services there. And they're doing projects with the CDC to make that, using blockchain technology to enable um, better um, transaction and faster transaction for emergency preparedness, which is important. Pocket Doc. So Pocket Doc is another American company. They're doing a prior authorization as one of their main, they have a, a, a whole system. They're basically focusing on building a blockchain network. Um, but one of the things that they are doing um, most kind of applicably right now is they're making um, prior authorization, which is basically means I have an insurance company, I'm insured by TCA or I'm insured by Aetna. We know for sure that that person is insured that day. <laughs> That's important. And right now, prior authorization takes also, is not always instantaneous. Uh, prior authorization also is needed when you need to get certain drugs um, to know whether or not you are allowed to have that drug uh, because of your um, conflicts or um, your prior history, and also whether or not your insurance company will pay for it. So, uh, prior authorization is basically a big sticky point and pain point that you're using that the US health system. And also here in Germany are using a lot of people with a lot of phone calls, a lot of faxes, and a lot of doctors' time doing this. So a lot of doctors are doing this instead of practicing medicine. The fact that we can do real-time prior authorization will really solve a lot of the inefficiency problems we have currently. Um, Chronic Lig is um, really trying to make um, a dent in the supply chain space. And supply chain to me obviously is just another hip area that I see blockchain technology fitting in and aligning most easiest in healthcare, um, as it is with other industries, supply chain management and contracting. So they are doing contracting, but they also are doing um, sensors, sensors to be put on supplies, pharmacy supplies, any supply chains for hospitals are obviously an amazing business. Every Band-Aid, every aspirin, every sheet costs money. Um, and so the fact that that's a, that we can monitor that better and predict it better using blockchain um, is a great opportunity um, and Chronic Lead is one of the leaders in that field. Um, Guard Time is um, Estonian company. They are actually creating, I, for, I forgot the name of the product in Estonia. I think it's EIS, does anyone know? It's an acronym. Well, basically we know Estonia rocks <laughs> in terms of digital. Um, digital um, access, but if you're an Estonian citizen, you have access to your whole um, health record. 
you can get prescribed, you can make your appointment, you can get, um, be, refill your drugs, and guard chain, guard time, which doesn't only work in healthcare, they work in other industries, there's a technology behind that. They recently did a partnership, I believe, with Epic, which is the largest health system and, I mean, the largest electronic health record provider in the United States, they actually have 50% of the market share which is a lot. <laughs> so the two combined could definitely shift the market. Um, and then um, Medical Chain, um, Medical Chain is a British company. I'm still learning what they're doing exactly, and I would love to have a dialogue with someone who knows more. Um, they do things on a project base and they're building a network. So from my understanding, they have, um, they're using Hyperledger for getting access to information. Um, and they're also using Ethereum and probably some other um, blockchain technologies to do the tokens exchange. So they have a few different products. They're basically trying to do telemedicine. They're of course trying to create electronic health records where a patient owns their own information, um, which I believe in, but I do have a lot of caveats about that. Um, they are doing some pilots with some NHS hospitals so I think this is one to really keep a good eye on and, um, and Europe because unlike you know, Estonia, UK, and Germany, there are national health systems, but they are not um, technology, technologically advanced. So the fact that they are focused on Europe, I think would be really interesting. And Nebula Genomics is um, obviously a really um, interesting one, a big one. Um, they are basically creating, they want to create their own database and they seem to be very successful at doing it um, for, to keep all personal gen genomic information. So it's not a surprise that companies like 23andMe, which I had in the last um, slide, or um, what's the other one, that comes to Ancestry.com, where people are doing genetic tests, um, they're charging consumers, they are reselling information to pharmaceutical companies. Uh, Nebula Genomics is an offshoot of George Church, who's from MIT. He's the um, spearhead of the personal genomic product, product, project, and he believes everyone should ask, have access to their genomic, um, their own genomic history. And so Nebula is basically creating that information data and then reselling it to, or exchange that with um, pharmaceutical companies. And why is this important? Well, this is gonna really guide um, clinical discovery. This is gonna really guide how quickly um, new drugs get into the market, get tested, clinical trials, and make it medicine more personalized. I know genomics is kind of a scary topic for some people, but it really answers the question is why one person can survive treatment of a certain type of cancer, another one doesn't. And they will, to me, they're in a very good position with their funding, um, their history, the big name of George Church behind it to really move that. Um, and to me, they're really, they're the only one I know who's leading the, the cause of integrating blockchain with genomics at the same time. So challenges, of course, we have to kind of go into what's gonna be challenging for blockchain. So I spend um, a lot of time at conferences, at events, um, listening, learning, presenting. Uh, both in the US and in Europe and digital healthcare. And I have to admit, blockchain does not come up that often. <laughs> so it is, it is still in its infancy phase. Um, the companies I listed there, I think those are the ones, or maybe for another kind of 10 or 15 more that are really leading it. Um, where the, cha the challenges with blockchain, I think is first is that it's added, it's almost like it's added a new level of digitalization and data exchange where some of the prerequisites are not already there. So for a first part, it's unstru unstructured data still existed, it exists. Unlike finance, there's a lot of unstructured data in healthcare. We still have written notes, we have charting, we have notes that are, um, we have data points that are not consistent across countries, not consistent across um, you know, health systems or nations, consistent across one provider. Um, that unstructured data, the, the, the fact that some data might be lost because it still is unstructured and cannot be put into the ledger properly, is obviously a lost opportunity for getting real advancement in blockchain technology and healthcare. And um, those intermediaries I mentioned, the PBMs, the, all the tech companies that make money every time a transaction goes to them and they pass it from part A to part B, they will miss out. 
Um, Epic, I mentioned Epic, which is a huge company in the United States. Um, their competitors are Cerner, um, Allscripts, Aetna. Those four basically have 80% of hospitals and physicians are using an electronic health record. Can, they, can those systems talk to each other? No. <laughs> But they like that because you have to choose. It becomes a competitive strategy. So challenges like that and have to fight against that makes it really hard. Um, I know there are some companies trying to get um, blockchain companies trying and are achieving getting um, different electronic health records to talk to each other and share information. So that if a patient goes to one hospital and they go to another hospital, another physician, that the electronic health record can be shared across the providers trying to advise on their care. That's. The, that's the gold standard that's what we want to get to, but we have to always be cognizant of there. There are there are other companies, very profitable companies around the world that have dominance and do not get as much benefit from that happening. So I do think uh, what we are going to probably see is um, just the way the banks have invested in blockchain technology. We're going to have the large electronic healthcare technology companies also <laughs> invested in blockchain, so they can stay ahead of the curve and make that their product extension so they won't be competing against, they'll actually get the revenue from that new innovation. Stack digitalization, I mean, that's the main challenge that I have, um, that I've noticed with Germany and a lot of other nations. The United States has this problem also. So I see um, blockchain as being, you know, maybe health 4.0, and some countries, including Germany, as health 1.5. <laughs> um, electronic prescribing doesn't exist. That means that there's not, uh, it's not a record of all the drugs that you take or you're able or a doctor can prescribe or electronically transfer a drug subscription to a pharmacy. That does not exist in Germany. So then how do you have a, bio, uh, a blockchain company that's gonna work in pharmacy adjudication in Germany? They, they don't have the data. Um, so a lot of blockchain technology only works well if you have really good data and digitalization already practiced and being used by the majority in the industry. Um, in the States, you also have this problem too with the fact that, again, interoperability doesn't exist in a lot of different health systems. So if you are saying that I want a patient to have their personal health record, how will they get that data? If, if they have been to five different hospitals, 10 different doctors in just the last five year period on, on 10 different systems, that's, that's a problem. And so those are some of the challenges that that just naturally inhibits the growth of blockchain. I think there's some really innovative companies working around it. Um, of course, um, the more, this is where the government really kind of gets in there, that the government um, for respective countries insists on more digitalization in healthcare. It forces people to implement it, and it forces um, more digitalization throughout healthcare, and then you can build blockchain above that to deliver better solutions. Um, disconnected networks are around the same too, and that's just, again, the fact that, you know, the electronic, even if we talk like electronic health records, um, electronic health records, even in um, more sophisticated networks, um, I'm gonna just use US for example, because I know them, I know the market really well there. Um, they would have electronic health record for that hospital, electronic health record for the, the physicians if they're part of that network. But again, that drug prescription that you get as an outpatient because you had an asthma attack that was given by another doctor, you would not get that information. It's in a whole separate network. Um, the drug company would have it. The drug insurance company would have it. Maybe your insurance company would have it, but not your physician. And so it's the lack of interoperability between networks that already are connected, but are not speaking to each other. And then the ownership of health information. Um, a lot of blockchain technology and actually digital health in general uh, believes, as I do too, that a person should have access to that health information, should have their own health record, um, which is great in theory, but unfortunately it is a theory right now because a lot of information is being stored within, within respective entities. So you have a health insurance company that has that information and they own it and they feel that they own it because it also has information about how they bill and charge um, for services. You have pharmaceutical companies that has clinical information, population information, um, adherence information, side effect information. They feel like they own it because of proprietary information that shows how well their drugs work in the market. Um, I can go on and on. 
But at the end of the day, that ownership question becomes an issue and a blockchain company that's working with different entities and different networks has to make a, a business model that um, finds a way that either if you, you can keep the information secure from the competing interests, people have competing, competing financial interests, or that everyone has an invested stake, a financial stake in sharing of information. Because at the end of the day, in, the, in private health systems particularly, um, health information and data is profit. It, it, it shows your profit margins, it shows your, how your market uses the, the information, how your market uses the supply, and there's the reasons why they don't want to share it. And so that ownership is a problem. And then last but not least is the variation in data security regulations. Um, even with digital healthcare, which again, I said it's an umbrella term, but some of those apps I used in the beginning, um, a lot of those apps still have to get FDA regulations. Um, there are you know, the, um, new regulation models here in, in Europe also. But the fact is that when you have a blockchain company or any healthcare technology company working in one market, they have to fulfill the data security regulations of that market. And they can be really, really strict. German um, data security regulations are very strict in Germany, where um, that's why we have to exist in those clearing houses, so that two entities cannot see too much information about one particular patient. But that variation that happens in one country looks completely different for Scandinavian countries, completely different for Estonia, completely different for the United States. And blockchain technology companies, at least that I've seen, the ones that are most successful in other industries, um, build scale because they're able to work internationally. And the data security regulations differ so greatly within a nation, within subsets of healthcare. And that really is going to slow the progress. I'm not saying it's going to hinder it, that, that blockchain technology will not. It's not possible, but it's close to progress and it definitely makes it harder for the smaller um, blockchain companies to really get success because of the amount of regulation, um, data security regulation and, and, and battle to get approved within a particular nation. Um, it's super expensive, costly and timely, and that will hinder your, your innovation, your, your ability to compete in the market. So that's why I always see that it's gonna be probably the largest Google on, offshoot companies, um, large IBM offshoot companies are gonna probably win that race faster because they have the legal teams and they can develop this, um, they get on the lobbyists to actually influence the data security regulation within each respective nation. Um, so here's my prediction, <laughs> it's really broad. Um, my, my prediction for um, blockchain and healthcare is that I, I, I see the expectation of the impact will focus on what is practical. And I see that happening first. Um, we talk about the inefficiencies and the waste. Um, I definitely see the supply chain management as being a limited friction um, application for blockchain technology, uh, especially supply chains that requires less personal health information. So that is, that's where, and, and that's where you see the most um, implementation happening first. Also, um, clinical research, um, because there's so much incentive of getting um, treatments to market faster. So any way we can use genomics research and blockchain technology to improve the progress of clinical research path, uh, I can see that being very practical and more likely to be something happening. But at the end of the day, I do see blockchain technology in healthcare, at least for the next five years, being in the back end. We won't even know it exists. When I say we, the average healthcare consumer, this is a group of blockchain practitioners, so you might will know it exists. But I do think that the average healthcare consumer will not feel the impact of blockchain technology on the supply chain or their um, insurance adjudication in the back end because the delivery of care will not be directly affected. That's what I see initially. Um, electronic health records. Um, especially personalized health records, so that means you have the majority of all of your health information, you own it, you can access it when you need it. That is obviously the, um, the great potential of blockchain technology, but I do think that's further along because of the challenges I mentioned in the slide before. And this is the gist of my presentation. <laughs> um, thank you for listening. I will um, take questions if there are any.